Dr. Michio Kaku, here's a piece of video of you on this network in 1979. If you look at the recent government reports concerning the Three Mile Island, the government now concedes that one to ten people will eventually die of cancer in the Three Mile Island area. Do you remember that time of many, many years, almost 40 years ago, and what has, have you changed in your thinking since then? Well, yes, I remember that very vividly because, you see, I'm a theoretical physicist, and I work with the theories of Einstein and the quantum theory, and so to be before a television camera is a new experience. But when the Three Mile Island accident happened, all the media was saying, we need a scientist. We need a scientist who can help to decipher this mess to the American people. So they contacted me, and so I said to myself, well, this is what I do for a living. I'm a physicist. And so I said to myself, okay, I'll get on national television, get on national radio, because the situation demands it. Not because I wanted to do it, but because people had to know the dangers, the positives, the negatives of energy, one of the big questions of the age. And that's sort of how I backed into uh, becoming a, a media person. You say in your book that there was a teacher when you were in the second grade that had an impact on you. Do you remember it? I'll never forget. <laughs> she walked in the room one day and said, God so loved the earth that he put the earth just right from the sun. Not too close, because the oceans will boil. Not too far, because the oceans will freeze, but just right from the sun. Now, I was floored. I mean, I was in second grade. And here was a scientific principle with a religious interpretation. I said to myself, my God, that's right. If we were too close, the oceans would boil. If we were too far, the oceans would freeze. We are in the so-called Goldilocks zone of the sun. Now, of course, we have seen 4,000 planets orbiting other stars, and almost all of them are too close or too far from the sun. So you have two points of view. Either God exists, and God so loves the earth that he puts the earth just right from the sun, or we have a crapshoot. What do you think? Well, now that we have found so many planets, 4,000 of them, we think that in the galaxy, our own backyard, there are billions upon billions of planets. On average, every single star you see at night has a planet going around it. Every single star on average. That it's indisputable that most of them are outside the Goldilocks zone. So you can still believe in God, but that's not an argument that clinches the deal. So. I want to ask you about a bunch of obvious uh, things that you write about and get you to define it for a generalist. What is a planet? Well, a planet is a, a mud ball that goes around a star. And I say mud ball because it doesn't release light of its own. It's dark. And it orbits around the sun, gaining energy. And we think that planets are very interesting because they could have life, because that's how we got started. And even in our solar system, we think that the planets may in fact harbor some form of life, maybe microbial life. And so we look at planets. We look at stars to find out where the planets are, but we focus on the planets because that perhaps is the habitat for life in the universe. What's a star? Well, a star is a gigantic solar furnace. It's a ball of hydrogen gas that releases energy by converting hydrogen into sunlight. And so a star is, in some sense, a gigantic hydrogen bomb. It obeys the same equations of Einstein, E equals mc squared, where m is hydrogen, E is sunlight that comes out of the star. What is a comet? Well, a comet is a piece of ice. It's like a dirty ice ball that whizzes around in the solar system. They're only like 10, 20 miles across. They're, they're not very big. But uh, they're basically made out of ice, remnants of the original solar system, which we think uh, once upon a time uh, surrounded the, the sun, but now orbit in a disk. What's the difference between a meteor and a meteorite? Well, that flash of light that you see whizzing across the sky is caused by a rock that burns up in the atmosphere, and that's called a meteor either the rock itself or the streak of light. However, once it hits the ground, it becomes a mineral. So we call it a meteorite. So meteorite is a meteor which has fallen from the sky. What's a galaxy? 
A galaxy consists of hundreds of billions of stars left over from the creation of the universe, the Big Bang. They look like a gigantic disk, a huge simmering disk of stars. Our galaxy, for example, is the Milky Way galaxy, and the nearest galaxy to us is the Andromeda galaxy. And we think there are about 100 billion galaxies in the visible universe. So believe it or not, that means we can actually count the number of stars in the visible universe. 100 billion galaxies, 100 billion stars per galaxy, and so that's the number of stars in the visible universe. 100 billion times 100 billion. What's an asteroid? An asteroid is a leftover from the creation of the solar system. We're talking about debris that extends from the Earth, uh, extends from Mars out to Jupiter, and we think it's a failed planet a planet between Mars and Jupiter that never quite condensed or maybe got too close to Jupiter and got broken up. So if you had to pick another place to live outside of the Earth, where would you go? I would go to another planet. Now we've looked at all the planets so far. None of them are exactly Earth-like. Venus we once thought was tropical. Many science fiction stories have astronauts sunbathing on the beaches of Venus. We now know that Venus is our evil twin. Just like the Earth, closer to the sun, but temperatures are 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That's above the melting point of lead and tin. If you were to walk on the surface of Venus, your feet would sink sink into molten metals. So you don't want to go to Venus. Mars is the closest. It's a rocky planet. It's a frozen desert, but it's the closest planet we have to the Earth. But further out, the moons of Saturn and Jupiter look very interesting. One of the moons of Jupiter is Europa. It has a liquid ocean underneath the ice cover. Who would have thought that you could have a liquid ocean whose volume is larger than the oceans of the Earth going around that distant planet called Jupiter. NASA at some point wants to put a submarine, a submarine under the ice to look for life forms under the ice cover. We talked about your second grade teacher. Do you remember, well obviously you must, when you first got interested in science? I remember that very distinctly. I was eight years old. Everyone was talking about the fact that a great scientist had just died. And I'll never forget, they flashed a picture of his desk on the newspapers. And the caption said something like this. This is the unfinished manuscript from the greatest scientist of our time. So I was eight years old. I said to myself, why couldn't he finish it? What's so hard that the greatest scientist couldn't finish it? It was a homework assignment, right? Why didn't he ask his mother? What could be so hard that you cannot answer it? I went to the library and I found out his name was Albert Einstein. That book was the unified field theory, the theory that would allow us to quote, read the mind of God. So I said to myself, whoa, that's for me. I want to be part of this grand, grand expedition to finish that book. Now today I can read that book. I can actually see all the dead ends that Einstein pursued. And we actually think we have it. It's called string theory. I'm one of the, one of the founders of the subject, co-founder of string field theory. And we think we can actually complete that book that Einstein set into motion, the theory of everything. There's even a Oscar movie, Oscar winning movie called The Theory of Everything. Go back to um, your childhood. Uh where were you born and what, what were your parents doing at the time? Well, my grandparents came to this country about a hundred years ago from? It, uh, from Japan and my grandfather was actually part of the cleanup operation in San Francisco after the San Francisco earthquake. So my family has a long history in California, but in 1942, because they were Japanese Americans, they were locked up in at Tule Lake, a relocation camp for four years behind machine gun and barbed wire, by the way. In 1946, they finally got out, but they were penniless. And we settled in Palo Alto, which is now ground zero for Silicon Valley. But back then, it was all apple orchards and alfalfa fields. And that's where I grew up, basically in a farm-like environment uh, in what is now called Silicon Valley. What did your parents do after they got out of the camp? There was nothing for them to do except menial jobs. Uh, their money was confiscated. They, they were broke. However, uh, there was a certain cachet to being a Japanese gardener. 
So my father became a uh, rather successful gardener, and he wanted me to take over the business. Uh, I tried gardening for a while, and after that I said, no way, <laughs> I gotta find another way to, to make a living. So when I was in high school, I decided I gotta do something. So I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, can I have permission to build an atom smasher in the garage? A 2.3 million electron volt, electron betatron particle accelerator. And my mom kind of stared at me and said, sure, why not? And don't forget to take out the garbage. <laughs> so I took out the garbage, I got 400 pounds of transformer steel, 22 miles of copper wire, and I built a Betatron Atom Smasher in my mom's garage. I blew out every single circuit breaker in the house every time I turned it on. My poor mother must have said to herself, why couldn't I have a son who plays basketball? Maybe if I buy him a baseball, and for God's sake, why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? Why does he have to build these machines in the garage? But that was a turning point. Because of the science fair projects that I did in high school, I earned the attention of an atomic scientist, Edward Teller. And Edward Teller pretty much took me under his wing, arranged for me to get a, a scholarship to Harvard. He knew exactly what I was doing. I didn't have to explain to him what antimatter was, what an accelerator was, what a betatron was. He knew immediately. And so he arranged for me to get a scholarship, and that started my, my life as a physicist. How did you meet him? Uh, well, he came to Albuquerque, New Mexico for the National Science Fair. People don't know that, but he was in the habit of recruiting young scientists. He went to the National Science Fair where I met him. I was actually on television with him uh, in uh, 1963 in Albuquerque at the National Science Fair. Now, when I graduated from Harvard, he interviewed me for a graduate fellowship. But at that point, he was very clear. He said, look, I'm looking for people who want to design warheads, hydrogen warheads. Your physics would be very valuable designing newer and better hydrogen warheads. He offered me a scholarship. He said, Los Alamos, Livermore, MIT, you name it, we can, we can arrange for you to work there. But you know, my interest then began to veer off in the direction of when I was a child, wondering what was Einstein's unfinished theory. You see, I wanted to work on an explosion bigger than a hydrogen bomb. I wanted to work on the Big Bang, the creation of the universe itself. And for me, a hydrogen bomb was just a footnote. I wanted to work on the creation of the universe. Here's Edward Teller. Uh, this video goes back to 1974. One of the decisive events which, con which convinced me to work on nuclear weapons was a speech by President Roosevelt the day after Hitler invaded the lowlands where he said it is the duty of the scientist to contribute the weapons which are needed for the defense of freedom. Do you agree? Well, that's a point that he stressed to me directly. He said, look, I'm recruiting. I'm recruiting for what the New York Times later called the Star Wars Scholarship. This scholarship propelled the brightest young minds in America from high school and college into Los Alamos to create the Star Wars program. Now, we know he had a checkered history. Many of the early designs did not work, in fact, for the Star Wars program. But that was the vision he had. He already had a very clear mission that uh, science should be used in the interest of national security. You see, those times were different from today. We had the Sputnik moment. In 1957, when Sputnik went up, it was practically your patriotic duty to use science in the interest of America because the Russians will one day orbit hydrogen bombs, not just Sputnik, but hydrogen bombs will orbit the Earth and the homeland will be endangered. So that's why a whole generation of young kids became scientists and engineers and technicians uh, because it was the so-called Sputnik moment. So when you were growing up, when did you discover that you had the brain to understand this stuff? Well. When I was a kid, I read about Einstein, and my favorite quote from Einstein was, if a theory cannot be explained to a child, then the theory is probably worthless. Meaning that every great theory has a picture behind it that children can understand. Newton 
talked about uh, you know things moving in space, friction, the motion of bodies. Einstein talked about clocks and meter sticks and rocket ships, things that children can understand. And yeah, there are books trying to explain space-time to children. And I said to myself, wow, if the great ideas are all based on pictures, and you understand those pictures, then mathematics is bookkeeping. It's complicated bookkeeping. You have to learn how to do the bookkeeping, of course. But it's bookkeeping. It's the physical principle, the concept that makes everything move. Now, when Einstein was 16, when he was 16, he found that principle. When he was 16 years old, he asked himself a question. Can you outrace a light beam? Now, we would say, well, that's a stupid question. I mean, outrace a light beam? What are you talking about? It took him 10 years from the age of 16 to 26, and he finally found the answer, and he changed world history. He found out that you cannot outrace a light beam. That's a children's question. And I said to myself, I can understand these children's questions. I just have to, of course, at some point learn the mathematics. But it's the principle that's involved. And today we know, of course, the speed of light is the ultimate velocity in the universe. Einstein is the cop in the block. And he figured that out starting at the age of 16. So all great theories have a physical principle behind it that children can visualize. Yeah, but go, go back to the, as you went through that process, what were the milestones where you began to gather the knowledge and you had people that said, if you want to do this, you got to go here? Who else had an impact on you? Well, to be very frank, a lot of people tried to give me advice when I was in high school, but I knew that most of the advice was wrong. You see, I tell kids today that you have to have a role model because the wheel's been invented already. Why do you have to reinvent the wheel if you want to become a sports figure or a movie star? The wheel's been invented. Find somebody you admire. Look at their life history. Follow the path. So I said to myself, I want to become a physicist, a theoretical physicist. I read about Einstein's life. So I knew exactly what I had to do at what age in my life. When do I have to get a PhD? When do I have to become a professor? When do I have to start to work on some big physical concept? It was no mystery to me. And so many young kids come up to me because they get bum advice from their high school teacher who simply wants them to go to trade school or, or, or learn something that, that uh, is a little bit better than pumping gas. So I say to myself, tell the kids, find a role model. The wheel's been invented already. So was Teller your role model? Uh, no, it was Einstein because Teller made a very big pitch for me to design weapons. And for me, at that point in my life, I realized that it's engineering. The basic physics of hydrogen warheads is well known, well established. Uh, as you know, uh, China and, and developing nations got the hydrogen bomb practically in the first try. And so it was an engineering problem. I'm a physicist. I wanted to look at the physical concept of new undiscovered things like why did the Big Bang take place? What was the energy source of the Big Bang? Why did it bang to begin with? Uh, these are questions of, of cosmic importance that are far beyond the engineering of simply assembling a hydrogen warhead. But again, why were you able to figure it out and most people are drowning in all this language and everything when they would be back in high school? Uh, well, I think, unfortunately, we have uh, a high school system that stresses memorization, stresses drudgery, and does not uh, encourage the bright students to come up. Uh, for example, in Asia, they have the expression, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. So if you're the oddball, if you're Steve Jobs, if you're Bill Gates, you get hammered down. But in America, we have the expression, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Now, I was the squeaky wheel. I wanted to get the attention of my teachers in high school. That's why I built the Atom Smasher. As I found out, uh, most of my teachers couldn't help me. But I wanted to, to do it because I said to myself, this is something that is doable. I just have to get the basic equipment, the basic physics I understood. And so it was not such a big deal for me to build an Atom Smasher. What did you do with it? Well, I turned it on. Well, the goal was to create antimatter. That was the whole thrust of the Science Fair project. Uh, I photographed antimatter. Antimatter comes naturally from a radioactive source called sodium-22. 
I put that in a cloud chamber, put in a magnetic field of 600 gauss, and the beautiful tracks of anti-electrons bent in the wrong direction. Electrons bend this way. Antimatter bends the opposite way in a magnetic field. And I took beautiful pictures, cloud chamber pictures, pictures that are research quality, in fact, they tell me. And uh, I won grand prize at the National Science Fair. And so I'll never regret doing a science fair experiment because that took me from a gardener's kid to getting a scholarship to Harvard and then beginning to work on the unified field theory. That's how it started. What did the rest of the kids think of you? Uh, well, they thought I was nuts, of course. Uh, the teachers that I had to work with, I simply told them that I had to cut transformer steel, I have to uh, uh, glue copper wire, and they helped me, but they didn't know what, was, uh, what I was doing. I mean, they just knew that here's this young kid who needs to cut 400 pounds of transformer steel, wind 22 miles of copper wire, and I did it on the high school football field. How big was this atom smasher that you had? Well, it was about this big, consumed six kilowatts of power. The capacitor bank was huge because it had to store the six kilowatts of power. And it gave us this tremendous crackling sound when I turned it on. The magnetic field was so powerful that in principle it would pull the fillings out of your teeth if you got too close to it. You had to be careful uh, if there was a hammer or anything like that. In principle, if I ran it on DC, it would literally uh, grab a uh, hammer from across the room and fling it toward you. Uh, that happens at MRI machines today uh, because they too have a magnetic field of about 10,000 gauss. Now, today we have a big one, a real big one outside Geneva, Switzerland. That's huge. That's a Large Hadron Collider. That is basically my little machine scaled up to the size of a city. And that is the leading scientific instrument in the world today outside Geneva. Why didn't we build it? Well, we had designs for the Super Collider to be built outside Dallas, Texas in the 1990s. But then on the last day of hearings, costs were rising and Congress wanted to know should they keep on budgeting the the Super Collider, and they canceled it. They gave us a billion dollars to dig the hole, a second billion dollars to fill up the hole. That's two billion dollars to dig a hole and fill it up. That's the wisdom of the United States Congress. Two billion dollars to dig and fill a, hole, fill a hole. Now, why did they cancel it? In the last day of hearings, one congressman asked a physicist, quote, will we find God with your machine? If so, I will vote for it. So that physicist was paralyzed. Here was the question, are we going to find God with your machine? So he said something like, well, we'll find the Higgs boson. Well, you could hear all the jaws hit the floor of the United States Congress. Ten billion dollars for another god darn subatomic particle. The vote was taken and the next day it was canceled. Since then, we physicists have bat our heads against the wall, wondering how should we have answered that question? Will we find God with this machine? What would you have said? I would have said this. I would have said God, by whatever signs or symbols you ascribe to the deity. This machine, the super collider, will take us as close as humanly possible to his greatest creation, Genesis. This is a Genesis machine. It will recreate on a microscopic scale the most glorious event in the history of the universe, its birth. Did that turn out to be the same thing that happened in Switzerland? That's right, that very same machine is now in Switzerland and it found the Higgs boson. And we hope to find what is called dark matter, which is the next form of matter beyond ordinary matter. But our machine was canceled because we didn't know how to talk the language of the average taxpayer. That was a real lesson. We have to understand where the taxpayer is, because in the old days, we would go to Congress and say one word, Russia. Congress would then whip out their checkbook and say, how much? How much for the next atom smasher? Those days are gone. You can't wanna, do that anymore. I want to show some video of you in 1997 saying some strong things about NASA. I'm here to try to save the space program from NASA bureaucrats. NASA bureaucrats are trying to fabricate new laws of physics that I've never seen before in any of my textbooks, in any of the books that I have published for PhD students. In fact, 
If any of these engineers were to submit that report to me for a course, I would flunk them. Why did you feel so strongly? I believe in the space program, but I think we have to do it safely because why will the taxpayers turn against the space program? When we lost the space shuttle, we came within a hair's breadth of losing the space program. The American people were saying enough is enough, seven beautiful astronauts perishing because some bureaucrat authorized the launching of that missile. And NASA wanted to launch the Cassini mission, a great mission by the way, which gave us gorgeous amounts of information about Saturn, with 72 pounds of plutonium. And this split the scientific community because on one hand we wanted Cassini to orbit Saturn, give us those great photographs. But on the other hand, if that rocket were to blow up, NASA's own computer program estimated that some of the plutonium could go to Disney World. Now, think about that for a moment. If you were a taxpayer and you realize that this rocket to Saturn all of a sudden caused the evacuation of Disney World and you had to cancel your vacations and cross Orlando, Florida off the tourist map, you'd get really angry, right? And so I said to myself, it's not worth it. Chances are it'll be a success. Chances are we'll go to Saturn and get glorious photographs, which is what happened actually. But I said to myself, it's a gamble. Do we want to take that gamble and perhaps lose the space program? I love the space program so much that you have to save it from the NASA bureaucrats. And their attitude was, launch the sucker. You say in your book that 544 humans have been in space and that 18 of those have died. What do those numbers mean to you? It means that 1% of the time, it's Russian roulette, 1% of the time you don't come back. 1% of the time. Now people ask me, would I want to go into space knowing that 1% of the time I'm not going to come back? You see, these people are test pilots. They are experienced astronauts. They go through the training. They take in courses. They know the odds. It's 1%. We're 60 years into the space age, and we have not got that number down below 1% misfire. In fact, to Mars, it's even worse, 30%. 30% of our space probes never reach it to Mars. And so, well, as Elon Musk said himself, he would love to be the first person on Mars, but he doesn't want to be there on impact. So I agree with that. Uh, we forget, space is not a Sunday picnic. 1% uh, of the time, our rockets blow up. Back in 2010, you were here uh, on our program called In Depth, which is a three-hour program. It's available, and the reason I mention it, it's available to our audience to go back and, and listen to three hours of you going into some detail on some of the things we're talking about. And uh, it would be a counter, not a counter, but it would, <clears throat> it would add information to people if they want to if they want to find out more of what you're, sure. you're thinking. Arthur C. Clarke, uh, this is from 1964, and I want you to put him into context, a little bit of video. What about the city of the day after tomorrow? Say, the year 2000. It will be possible in that age, perhaps only 50 years from now, for a man to conduct his business from Tahiti or Bali just as well as he could from London. I am perfectly serious when I suggest that one day we may have brain surgeons in Edinburgh operating on patients in New Zealand. How's he doing on his predictions? Well, he's right on the money. Now we have internet, we have telemedicine. Doctors in one place can do surgery using robots, in fact, even beyond what he said, uh, uh, can handle robots, instruct the robots on the other side of the planet Earth. Uh, we have robots at Duke University that communicate with robots in Kyoto, for example, and uh, different operations that you can do in Duke University, we can also do in Kyoto University. So if anything, I think he underestimated the, the power of the internet. And uh, he mentioned, you know, being able to communicate anywhere on the planet Earth. Guess what? Elon Musk just last week unveiled a plan to create a planetary internet. Thousands of mini satellites, thousands of mini satellites, so that you're on the top of Mount Everest, and there you are downloading the Kardashians. And so today you have to have a microwave tower next to Mount Everest to do that. But if satellites, thousands of mini satellites orbit the Earth, then yeah, exactly what Arthur C. Clarke said could become a reality. What does a theoretical physicist do when he has free time? Well, for Einstein, it was like playing the violin. 
it was a time for him to think back at his work and to, to rethink his strategy. He also liked sailing, okay? Now, for me, well, I'm a professor, and I realized that I like to teach, but I can bore 20 kids teaching a course, but if I'm on radio or television, I could bore uh, 20 million kids. So I said to myself, wow, that's an opportunity to touch the minds of young people. Because whenever I interview a Nobel Prize winning scientist, I ask them, when was it that that spark of, of science began to germinate? And they always say, when I was 10. 10 is that magic year. You have that epiphany. You went to the planetarium. You saw your first telescope. You saw the moon for the first time in the rings of Saturn. You saw a microbe in a microscope. That epiphany stays with you for the rest of your life. So when you're an elderly scientist and you're tired and you have uh, all these obligations, it's like a well. You draw water from that well continually over the decades because you remember, you remember that epiphany you had when you were 10 years old and that keeps you going. Do you play the violin? Uh, no. Uh, personally, I like to do figure skating. Um, How long have you done that? Uh, well, for the last 15 years. Um, when I was a kid, I always liked to watch figure skating on TV, but to do something like that, that's rather complicated. But I realize as an adult that it's nothing but Newtonian physics. And if you are a physicist, you understand center of gravity, moment of inertia, you understand the basics of, of figure skating. So I said to myself, I can learn that. <laughs> and so, yeah, if you see me spinning and jumping at Rockefeller Center, you know that it's me on the ice. So, if I were 19 years old and I wanted to see you in a classroom, for that matter, now my age, but if I wanted to start starting out and I was interested, where would I find you? And what would, why would I be in your classroom and how large would that classroom be today? Well, normally I teach to graduate students and at that level, uh, we're talking about a PhD program. You're only talking about maybe five, ten students because these people are, are raring to go and they're doing PhD level work. But the university, the City University of New York, has so many young people at the freshman level, unwashed, raw students at the freshman level that they said, look, you got to teach freshmen. So I decided to teach astronomy. And I was shocked. I looked at the astronomy final and it was uh, memorize all the moons of Saturn and memorize all the moons of Jupiter. That was the final exam. <laughs> and I said to myself, I don't even know the moons of Saturn. I don't even know the moons of Jupiter. This is a worthless exam. You simply look it up in a book. I wanted to know planetary evolution, where stars come from, how they die, how they mature. So I threw out the curriculum and I decided to import NASA videotapes about going to the planets and begin to talk about planetary evolution. Planets obey certain basic laws. They're born, they mature, and they die. You can teach these concepts because, as Einstein said, you can teach principles to children, especially pictorial principles. And so that's why I decided to take this small little astronomy course and make it modern. Now we're up to like 500 kids. The course is bursting at the seams um, because people have a thirst. If presented well, people will gravitate toward it. You know, when I first did television, people said that, quote, science doesn't sell on TV. But I said to myself, well, that can't be right because a million people subscribe to Scientific American, another million people subscribe to Discover Magazine, and when there's a science special, well, you can actually get five million people to tune into that. So there's an untapped audience there. And then when cable took off, we found it. Yes, there really are five to 10 million people out there that will tune into a science program if, and only if, is presented well with special effects, with a very cogent storytelling, people will gravitate toward it because we're born scientists. We're born wondering why the sun shines. How often have you been involved in a television special? Uh, well, I work with BBC, Discovery Channel, the Science Channel, hosting specials for them sometimes, and of course, Talking Heads. I regularly do uh, Talking Heads for different science specials. You do radio, and where can people find your radio shows and how often? Uh, well, I'm on every week. Um, they can go to my website, mkaku.org, or Facebook. We're up to 3 million, 3 million fans on Facebook. 
On Twitter, we're up to 600,000 on Twitter. And they can find my radio schedule. Uh, the radio program airs in about 60 cities across the United States. And, you know, it's commercial radio. I mean, think about it for a moment. Commercial radio. We're not talking public radio. We're talking commercial radio. And the program's a big success. So it means that if presented well, people have a thirst a real thirst to understand what's happening in the world, but it's never presented well. It's always presented as memorization, as learning stupid facts and figures you're going to forget the next day. You talk about Ray Kurzweil in your book. Here is some video of him talking about life expectancy, and I want uh, your input on this. People say you take all these supplements and other pills. That's going to enable you to live hundreds of years. and. Uh, the answer is no. That's just to get to bridge two, and bridge two is not far away. According to my models, 10 to 15 years from now, we'll be adding more than a year every year to your remaining life expectancy. Put Ray Kurzweil in the context, and he has a plan for himself, I think. Uh, That's right. How many pills do you take a day? I think he takes uh, several hundred. Uh, I, I talked to him once, and it's, it's a considerable number. He also talks about two kinds of immortality. One is digital immortality, which is coming very fast, by the way. Silicon Valley companies are already offering a version of that now. And then there's biological immortality. Now, digital immortality takes everything known about you on the Internet, your digital footprint, your credit card records, what movies you see, what wines you like to buy, what countries you visit, your videos, your pictures, your audio tapes, and creates a profile that's digitized which will last forever. So when you go to the library of the future, you will not take out a book about Winston Churchill. You'll talk to Winston Churchill. You'll talk to a hologram, and that hologram will have all the mannerisms, all the knowledge, anecdotes, stories, everything known about Winston Churchill, and you'll talk to him. I wouldn't mind talking to Einstein. I would love to have an opportunity to talk to an Einstein based on everything that is known about the man. We could be digitized. There's a Silicon Valley company already offering to do this. And our great, 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 great granddaughter may want to find out who was their great, 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 great grandfather because we've all been digitized. Now, to, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, is this really you? Well, it all depends on how you define you. If we define you as a biological entity, then this is a tape recorder, very sophisticated. But if you are the sum total of all your memories, emotions, feelings, if that is you, then yeah, in some sense, you could live forever because you've been digitized. What is, I want your definition, please, for artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a machine that can do anything that a human can do. And let's be blunt about this. Right now, um, if you compare artificial intelligence to animals, our most advanced robot, Asimo, has the abilities of a cockroach, a retarded, lobotomized, slow cockroach. Our robots today can barely walk across the room. They can barely sweep the floor or, or turn a valve. But I foresee a time in the future when they'll be as smart as a mouse, being able to run around, find mates really quick, as smart as a rat, a rabbit, eventually as smart as a cat or a dog. But by the time they reach the level of a monkey, they could become dangerous. Uh, that's at the end of the century, I think, because uh, monkeys have a self-awareness. They know they are not human. They know they're monkeys. Now, dogs are confused. You see, dogs think that we are the top dog, and they're the underdog, and they're part, we're part of the same dog tribe, the dog pack. So dogs are confused about who they are. But monkeys, they know they're not human. Once robots become as smart as monkeys, then I think we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. But that's not for many decades to come. <clears throat> Your own life, did you have brothers and sisters? Yes. Mm -hmm. How many? I had one older brother and one younger brother. And what did they end up doing? Uh, well, they're retired. Uh, my younger brother is a cardiologist, and he's still in private practice. And um, yeah, so we all went to college, and we all did what our parents dreamed of, and they wanted us to be successful. What did your mother do? We talked about your father. What did right. she do? 
Oh, well, they passed away. Uh, my father was a gardener and my mother was a maid uh, because, you know, we were always strapped for money. I still remember my parents arguing about money and where should the money go because, you know, we were flat broke during that period of time. And I still remember my mother talking about college. That college is the key to everything. And I had this vision that college was this city in the sky. I still have that vision that there's this there's a city in the sky called college, because that's the way my mother put it. And so now I realize that she was onto something. And that is, yes, college is a gateway, a gateway to uh, success in, in modern society. How much of all of your education and where did you get it all was paid for in scholarships that you got? Uh, that's right. I, I got accepted to Harvard and Harvard and also uh, the Hearst Engineering Scholarship that Edward Teller uh, founded. Uh, so I was the beneficiary of that. And then in my PhD program, uh, there was money from the National Science Foundation. So luckily, even though struggling artists have a hard time scraping together their next, uh, their next meal, in sciences there is funding. The National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, will fund enterprising uh, young PhD students. And so that, I think, is, is a good thing. You know, there's a brain drain into the United States because there is funding. Both private entrepreneurs, Silicon Valley billionaires, will sponsor startups. And there is a National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy for more speculative and cutting edge kinds of research. So there is a brain drain into the United States at the present time. Go back to your 10 year old example. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, do you have children? Uh, yes. I mean, uh -huh. uh, two. And what kind of work are they in? Uh, the older daughter is a brain doctor. Um, she's a neurologist. And she's actually a professor now, a professor at Boston University. And the other? Uh, the other one followed a different uh, road. She is a French pastry cook. She went to an exclusive uh, school where they train and accredit uh, French pastry cooks. And she's done very well in Manhattan. Your mother said she wanted you to find a nice Japanese woman. Is that who you found for, well, for your wife? Uh, my second wife is Japanese, and so uh, she, my, my uh, mother finally got her dream. However, I should point out that my mother eventually came down with Alzheimer's, and so it's very unfortunate that she could not even recognize me. Uh, toward the very end, she could not even recognize herself. And so I thought that life in some sense is so unfair. You struggle so hard when you're young, and you're always poor, always wondering where the next uh, check is going to come from, and then you lose your memories. You lose your sense of who you are, who your children are. You know, sometimes life can be very unfair. How, what are you thinking at this age? I, do I get it that you're 71? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are you thinking about how long are you going to teach, and <clears throat> what happens to the brain? You must know a lot about that, the brain as you get older. Well, I realize that the body does, of course, decay, but the brain decays much slower. You could be uh, sharp as, uh, as, as a whistle, even in your old age. Einstein was publishing uh, very important papers, even to the, uh, the last days of his life. Now, when you get older, you say to yourself, do I want to write lots of papers that will get published, but are worthless? that you know they're nothing but dotting the, the I's and crossing the T's. I'd rather work on big problems now. Uh, of course, there's a danger that nothing's going to come out of these big problems. But I would rather work on a big problem and fail than work on a lot of little problems and, and succeed. From a standpoint of, of uh, financial accomplishments, w what categories have been the most lucrative for you? In other words, teaching, documentaries, radio programs, speaking, books? Well, when I first started to write books, uh, people told me you're never going to get rich writing a book uh, because of the fact there's this cutthroat uh, competition out there. And uh, as Bill Clinton knows, uh, you can make more money doing uh, speaking at events and keynoting conferences and stuff like that. And that's something that I enjoy. It's something that I enjoy because you get to engage people and talk about things that are on their mind, things that are, are troubling them. And so I get invited to keynote conferences, for example. Is that the best economically, the speaking? Uh, probably, and if you take a look at Bill Clinton and uh, George W. Bush and uh, people, they're on the circuit. In fact, I bump into them regularly. I've been on several programs uh, speaking with Bill Clinton. And how often do you teach your class with 500 kids in it? Well, the university said, look, 
Whenever I teach, I mean, whenever I have to go out and keynote a conference or something, I disrupt the university. I have to find a substitute teacher. I have to make sure that the grad students can, can grade the papers and stuff like that. Rather disruptive. And so they made a deal with me. They said, look, if, you, if we cut, cut your slack so that you have more time for, for speaking and stuff, um, you can spread the good name of the university. The university benefits, you benefit because you don't have to run back to the college every time there's a speaking engagement. And that was a win-win situation. So they reduced my teaching load now, which is, I think, the ideal situation. How big is your university? It's one of the biggest on the planet Earth. The City University of New York has a quarter of a million students. It is huge. The State University of New York, of course, uh, services the entire state. The City University of New York services, well, eight million people altogether. That's the population of New York. Uh, Brooklyn alone would be the third largest city in the United States if you were to cut up New York City. So uh, CUNY, the City University of New York, is gigantic. It is absolutely humongous. Here's some, you write a lot about this in, in your book. You talk about going to Mars, and, uh, but here's a motion picture. Star Trek, 1979. It's not very long, I just want to show it and have you put the movies that we see in this country, again, in context with learning science. Have you seen all these movies? Oh, I love them. Uh, I'm a science fiction junkie. So I watched all the Star Trek films and all the Star Trek stuff. When I was a kid, I just really loved it, gorged on the stuff. Today, however, I do a lot of cringing because I realize, oh, they got that law of physics wrong. Oh, they got that wrong. So a lot of times I have to suspend what I know about physics and just let my imagination roam. And that's the way to enjoy these films. So I, I love these films. 1951, the day the Earth stood still. Let's watch this one. Did you see this movie? Yes, uh, that movie was very important because up to then, the paradigm was War of the Worlds. The bad guys versus the good guys were the underdog, were the good guys. That flipped it totally 180 degrees the other way. All of a sudden, we became the enemy. We were the enemy of ourselves. We are, were our worst enemy. And so that movie was, was incredibly important because it shifted the entire focus away from Martians invading the Earth to looking inward, to looking at our own problem. That if we explore outer space, if we mess up the Earth, we don't want to mess up Mars. We have to get our own act together. And so I thought that, that uh, motion picture was pivotal because it shifted the center of gravity of science fiction. What specific, and this is book number nine for you? Uh, I think 14, I think. Yeah, they listed eight in the oh. uh, front part of the it. The other ones are PhD level textbooks. But this one's called The Future of Humanity, and what was your goal in this book versus the others? Well, the other is I talk about the future like 100, 200, 300 years in the future, but what's the pot of gold out there? What's the ultimate destiny of all these things? And so I said to myself, well, you know, as Carl Sagan once told me, uh, we should become a two-planet species. We should uh, become, we should join other civilizations in some kind of, of galactic, uh, galactic civilization if it exists. And so, um, as people pointed out to me, the dinosaurs did not have a space program. And the destiny of the dinosaurs was to go extinct. That was their destiny. Our destiny is unwritten. But 99% of all life forms, their destiny is extinction. The norm for Mother Nature is extinction. If you dig right under our feet right now, you will see the bones of the 99.9% .9 that no longer walk the surface of the earth. Now we're different. We have self-awareness. We can see the future. We plot, we scheme, we plan. And so perhaps we're going to evade this um, conundrum and maybe survive, but we need an insurance policy. That's why this book is different from the other books, because the other books talk about the steps, but what is the goal? What's the pot of gold out there? And I'm saying is that one pot of gold would be to have an insurance policy, a plan B, in case a supervolcano, an asteroid, another ice age wipes out humanity on the Earth or severely dents uh, our history. So 20, this is 20 years from now. You'll be 91. You'll still be teaching and speaking. And you look back at what we've done in these 20 years, what will it be? And well, who, will, who will have been responsible for it? 
Well, in some sense, my goal in life, that is what I want to do is, we physicists like to rank civilizations by energy, type one, type two, type three. A type one is planetary, they control the weather. Type two is stellar, they control stars and play with stars like Star Trek. Star Trek would be a type two civilization. Then there's type three, galactic, they play with black holes, they roam the galactic space lanes like Star Wars. Now, what are we on this scale? We are type zero. We get our energy from dead plants. But we can see that in 100 years, we will be type one. But it's not guaranteed because we still have all the savagery of our rise from the swamp just a few hundred years ago. We have the same sectarianism, fundamentalism, nationalism, all the backwardness of our rise from the swamp. But I see that by 2100, we will become a planetary civilization. And so I want to help speed up that process to make sure that we don't let the savagery of our rise from the swamp overwhelm our destiny, which is to become type one. For example, what language will this type one civilization speak? Already on the internet, uh, English and Mandarin Chinese are the two dominant languages. And the internet itself is the first type one technology that fell into our lap as, as we're still type zero. So we see the beginning of a type one planetary civilization, but we may not make it. Uh, Elon Musk just said that last month. Why don't the aliens visit us? There should be a lot of type one civilizations out there. They don't visit us, perhaps, because they didn't make the transition to type one. Do you have any idea why over the years, and it's been that case since I was uh, even aware of it, that we refer to aliens as little green men that are gonna land here someday? Why, is it, why are they little green men? Uh, well, I think it's part of our subconscious because Hollywood gives us these images as children and as grown-ups, we, we access these ancient memories of bug-eyed monsters, for example. By the way, I have some advice for, for people that claim to have met these aliens. Many people email me and say they've been abducted by aliens from outer space, so they know they're out there. My attitude is, the next time you're abducted by an alien, steal something. I don't care whether it's an alien paperweight, an alien chip, an alien pen, steal something. Because there's no law against stealing from an extraterrestrial. There's no law in the books that says you can't steal from an extraterrestrial. What's your guess? Has there been extraterrestrials land on this planet? You can't rule it out. Uh, I don't think so. But if you ask for hard evidence, there's no hard evidence either way. And so there is that possibility that in the past we might have been visited. It can't be ruled out. Last video. You were alive, you were young, you were uh, 8 to 10 years old. This is 1957, October the 4th. Somebody named Major John Glenn on a program called Name That Tune. Uh, what do you think of the Russian satellite, which is circling the Earth at 18,000 miles <laughs> per hour? Well, to say the least, George, they're out of this world. But <laughs> uh, This is uh, really quite an advancement for not only the Russians, but for international science. I think we'd all agree on that. It's the first time anybody has ever been able to get anything out that far in space and keep it there for any length of time. And this is probably the first step toward space travel or moon travel, something we'll probably run into maybe in Eddie's lifetime here at least. <laughs> Eddie, would you like to take a trip to the moon? No, sir, I like it fine right here. <laughs> Major John Glenn was a test pilot then, and he had not gone to space. Um, how, have, in your opinion, how have we done since 1957? Well, I think NASA, unfortunately, became the agency to nowhere. It just spun wheels, uh, went around the planet Earth. The space station was supposed to be the gateway for Mars and the planets, and that became a big turkey in outer space. So I think we've been basically spinning wheels for 50 years, but last month, just last month, there was this excitement, this electricity, when the Falcon Heavy rocket blasted off, because that was a moon rocket, the first moon rocket in 50 years to blast off from Cape Canaveral. And guess who paid for it? Our taxpayers' money? No, a private individual, Elon Musk, paid for a moon rocket and basically gave it to the American people for free. This is unheard of. Five years ago, ten years ago, if you were to say that a private individual would create his own moon, personal moon rocket and give it to the people of the world, people would think you were nuts. But it actually happened. So we're in a new ball game now. A new ball game where prices have been dropping dramatically, 
where the movie The Martian cost 100 million, but to go to Mars only cost 70 million dollars. So Hollywood movies about Mars actually cost more than actually going to Mars. That's how cheap space travel has become. India, China, China is going to plant their flag on the moon. It's a national goal for the Chinese people. So things have changed. A sea change from the 1960s. Prices have dropped. Private entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley are funding a lot of this stuff, and China, India, everyone's jumping into the game. We're going to have a traffic jam around the moon. Just got 30 seconds. If you, what would you tell an eight year old today watching you right now, and I'm sure they've seen you in the audiences when you speak, what should they do to prepare to become a theoretical physicist or a scientist? Well, I tell them, keep that flame alive. That is, keep that spark, that inspiration, whatever it was that set you off in the direction. For me, it was trying to follow the works of Einstein, to complete Einstein's dream. Whatever it is, follow that star, because that's going to keep you going. Because there has to be a North Star that inspires you. Because, yeah, there's a lot of math you have to know. Yeah, you got to pay your dues. But ultimately, it's that spark of creativity and innovation that keeps you going in spite of all the obstacles. Our guest has been Michio Kaku, and the title of the book is The Future of Humanity. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure.